Once upon a time in West Africa, the Mali Empire emerged as a powerful and thriving realm. This grand empire, which existed from 1240 to 1645, was brought to life by its founder, Sundiata Keita, whose reign from 1230 to 1255 marked the beginning of Mali's remarkable journey. Sundiata's vision, central government, diplomacy, and well-disciplined army laid the foundation for a colossal military expansion that would transform the Mali Empire into the largest empire ever seen in Africa. At the helm of the Mali Empire, Mansa Musa I, who ruled from 1312 to 1337, orchestrated an era of unprecedented territorial expansion, cultural flourishing, and remarkable wealth. Mali's strategic location served as a vital link between North Africa, accessed through the Sahara Desert, and the Niger River to the south. This pivotal role allowed Mali to control the trade routes that crisscrossed West Africa, dealing in precious commodities like gold, salt, copper, ivory, and even slaves. These vibrant trade networks drew Muslim merchants seeking wealth and prosperity to the empire. The converted Mali rulers became champions of Islam and facilitated its spread, with centers of learning like Timbuktu gaining prominence. However, beyond the bustling cities like Niani, Jene, and Gao, the rural population in Mali largely adhered to their traditional animist beliefs. The Mali Empire's zenith was marked by an extensive territory, cultural vitality, and immense wealth. However, like all great empires, it was not immune to the forces of time and change. The empire faced its decline in the 1460s due to internal strife, shifts in trade routes, and the ascension of the neighboring Songhai Empire. Despite its fall, a small part of the Western Mali Empire managed to endure into the 17th century. The Mali Empire found its roots in the Sudan region of West Africa, a land that had been inhabited since the Neolithic era. This area, characterized by dry grasslands and savanna, was blessed with annual rainfall suitable for agriculture. The fertile land supported the cultivation of cereals like African rice and millet, alongside pulses, tubers, root crops, oil, fiber plants, and fruits. Fishing and cattle herding also contributed to the food supply, while copper deposits were tapped for trade. Gold was potentially mined or panned, although concrete evidence from that period is scarce. The Ghana Empire, thriving from the 6th to the 13th century, became the first dominant power in West Africa, establishing an empire rooted in military might and wealth derived from regional trade. Despite its location not corresponding to modern Ghana, it was situated to the northwest and faced a decline by the late 12th century, ridden with civil wars, revolts by subjugated chieftains, and crop failures. The empire began to unravel, with the Kingdom of Soso, also known as Susu, capturing a significant portion of its territory. The Soso king Sumanguru, who ruled around 1200, imposed trade restrictions on the Mali region, leading to a rebellion by the native Molinke tribe. Sundiata Keita, whose name translates to Lion Prince, was a Molinke prince. His journey as a warrior began in the 1230s when he rose against the oppressive kingdom of Soso. Sundiata united with other dissatisfied chiefs who had grown weary of Sumanguru's harsh rule. Their collective strength culminated in a decisive victory over the Soso at the Battle of Krina, also known as Kirina, in 1235. By 1240, Sundiata had seized the former capital of Ghana. Sundiata established a centralized government comprising tribal leaders and influential Arab merchants. This governing body, known as the Assembly or Gabara, proclaimed Sundiata as the paramount monarch and bestowed him with titles such as Mari Diota, which means Lord Lion. He christened his empire Mali, signifying the place where the king lives. The assembly decreed that all future kings would hail from the Keita clan, even though the title was not exclusively granted to the eldest son of a ruler, causing disputes among potential successors. Throughout the history of the Mali Empire, the Mansa, or king, received assistance from an assembly of elders and local chiefs, holding audiences in the royal palace or beneath a vast tree. The king served as the supreme dispenser of justice and sought guidance from legal advisors. He relied on key ministers, such as the chief of the army and the master of the granaries, later transformed into the treasury. Various officials, including the master of ceremonies and the leader of the royal orchestra, supported the king. As the ultimate monarch, the Mansa had a monopoly over crucial trade goods, like gold nuggets, while traders dealt with gold dust. 
The king possessed mystical attributes, and all slaves showed unwavering loyalty to him. No one could be present in the king's presence while he dined, and visitors had to approach barefoot, bow down, and scatter dust over their heads. This cult of leadership and the profound centralization of authority in a single figure played a significant role in determining the empire's prosperity, fluctuating with the capabilities, or lack thereof, of its rulers. The governance challenges of the future were yet to be faced, as Sundiata continued to expand his realm, conquering the former kingdoms of Ghana, Walata, Tadmeka, and Songhai. The empire's capital, Niani, selected for its proximity to forests and waterways and protected by mountains, thrived as a hub for trade goods. Conquered chieftains paid tribute, while local rulers retained their positions but worked alongside Mali-appointed governors supported by garrisons. The empire's flourishing trade networks turned Mali into one of Africa's wealthiest empires, astounding both Europe and Arabia. Furthermore, foreign visitors noted the empire's commitment to justice, safety in travel, and abundant food, greatly benefiting the ordinary people of Mali. In the heart of the Mali empire's prosperity lay the art of trade, a lifeline that had nourished the region for generations. Situated strategically between the lush rainforests of southern West Africa and the powerful Muslim caliphates of North Africa, Mali thrived. The Niger River served as a gateway to the heart of Africa and the Atlantic coast. Furthermore, camel caravans controlled by the Berbers, which traversed the Sahara Desert, ensured the flow of valuable goods from the north. The Mali rulers had an ingenious system in place to bolster their wealth, they taxed trade goods passing through their domain, bought goods at competitive prices, and then resold them at higher rates. Moreover, Mali was blessed with access to its natural resources, particularly the gold-rich regions of Galam, Bambuk, and Beret. One of the most vital trade transactions was the exchange of gold dust for salt from the Sahara. Gold was especially sought after by European powers like Castile in Spain and Venice and Genoa in Italy, where coinage was increasingly minted in this precious metal. Timbuktu, a city founded around 1100 by the Tuaregs, played a pivotal role in this trade ecosystem. Situated at the bend of the Niger River, it served as the starting point for trans-Saharan caravans. Timbuktu became one of the most important and cosmopolitan trade centers in Africa. It witnessed the passage of valuable goods such as ivory, textiles, horses crucial for military use, glassware, weapons, sugar, cola nuts, a mild stimulant, cereals like sorghum and millet, spices, stone beads, crafts, and slaves. These goods were acquired through barter or payment using agreed-upon commodities such as copper or gold ingots, specific amounts of salt or ivory, or even cowrie shells sourced from Persia. The Mali Empire experienced its second golden era during the reign of Mansa Musa I in the early 13th century. With an army numbering approximately 100,000 soldiers, including a cavalry corps of 10,000 horses, and led by the skilled general Saran Mandian, Mansa Musa was able to not only maintain but also expand Mali's empire. He doubled the empire's territory, extending its dominion to the Gambia and Lower Senegal in the west, quelling tribes along the length of the western Sahara border region to the north. In the east, Mali's rule reached as far as Gao on the Niger River, and to the south, it encompassed the Beret region and the forests of what would later be known as the Gold Coast. The Mali Empire thus became a tapestry of different religious, ethnic, and linguistic groups. To govern this diverse empire, Mansa Musa divided it into provinces, each ruled by a governor, father, personally appointed by him. These governors were responsible for local taxes, ensuring justice, and resolving tribal disputes. The administration was further improved through meticulous record-keeping and central government offices in Niani. With more tribute from the conquered chiefs, control over additional trade routes, and the exploitation of natural resources, Mansa Musa and the elite of Mali accumulated immense wealth. When the Mali king visited Cairo in 1324, he spent or generously gave away so much gold that the price of bullion dropped by 20%. The tales of this wealth gave rise to endless rumors that Mali was a kingdom paved with gold. Around 1375, a mapmaker in Spain was inspired to create Europe's first detailed map of West Africa, part of the Catalan Atlas. In this map, Mansa Musa is depicted wearing a magnificent gold crown and proudly holding a massive lump of gold. 
This portrayal spurred European explorers to search for the source of this gold and the mythical trading city of Timbuktu. The influence of Islam began to permeate West Africa through the Arab merchants who ventured into the region for trade. Notable Muslim travelers and historians such as Ibn Battuta and Ibn Khaldun recorded the conversion of Mali's first ruler, Sundiata, to Islam. However, Mali's oral tradition, meticulously preserved by specialized storytellers known as griots, paints a slightly different picture. While acknowledging the presence of Islam in Mali before Sundiata's time, the oral tradition maintains that Mali's first ruler did not abandon the indigenous animist religion. Sundiata's son, Mansa Uli, embarked on a pilgrimage to Mecca in the 1260s or 1270s, setting a trend followed by many of Mali's rulers, the real impetus for the spread of Islam in West Africa, however, came during the reign of Mansa Musa I. Impressed by his experiences during his journey to Mecca, he brought Muslim architects, scholars, and books back to the Mali. Mosques, including Timbuktu's Great Mosque, also known as Jingareba or Jingareba, were constructed. Quranic schools and universities gained recognition and became centers of international repute, offering studies that extended beyond religion and encompassed subjects like history, geography, astronomy, and medicine. The establishment of vast libraries stocked with tens of thousands of books and manuscripts further solidified Mali's intellectual prominence. As the number of converts grew, more Muslim clerics from other regions were drawn to West Africa. Native converts, educated in places such as Fez, Morocco, emerged as influential scholars, missionaries, and even saints, contributing to the development of an indigenous African form of Islam. However, indigenous animist beliefs persisted, especially within rural communities. Travelers like Ibn Battuta, who visited Mali around 1352, documented these practices. Moreover, Islamic studies were conducted in Arabic rather than native languages, which limited its popularity outside the educated clerical class of towns and cities. The blend of indigenous religious practices and beliefs ensured that Mali's rulers did not completely dismiss the ancient traditions followed by the majority of their subjects. The architectural wonders of the Mali Empire, some of which still stand, serve as iconic symbols of Africa's rich pre-colonial history. Mali's architects faced unique challenges due to the scarcity of stone in the region. Therefore, they predominantly constructed buildings using beaten earth, known as banco, reinforced with wood beams that extended from the exteriors. Despite these limitations, the mosques, in particular, remain striking multi-storied structures with towers, large wooden doors, and tiered minarets. Warehouses, known as fondacs, were also prominent in Mali and used to store goods before they were distributed elsewhere. These warehouses often featured up to 40 apartments for merchants to reside in. Another noteworthy example of Mali's baked mud buildings includes the expansive mosques in Mopti and Jenne, even though many of them are reconstructions dating back to the early 20th century. Excavations at Niani have unearthed remains of houses with stone foundations, confirming accounts from later sources that wealthier individuals within society built stone houses. Arab chroniclers also describe a unique type of domestic structure constructed using beaten earth bricks with conical roofs composed of wooden beams and reeds. The floors were crafted from a blend of earth and sand. These architectural wonders reflect Mali's rich history and cultural legacy, echoing through the ages. The Molinke people of Mali possessed a vibrant tradition of storytelling, with epic tales and community histories being passed down through the generations. These narratives, expertly conveyed by specialized storytellers known as griots, often found their complement in music. Within the Mali Empire, there were songs dedicated to specific individuals with the exclusive privilege of having these songs sung in their honor. Renowned warriors and hunters were especially likely to be the subjects of these musical tributes. Music held a significant role during religious festivals, accompanied by the mesmerizing performances of masked dancers. In addition to its oral traditions and music, Mali exhibited artistic prowess through pottery and sculpture. This artistic heritage had deep roots and had flourished in renowned centers like Jenne since the 9th century. The sculptures typically stood up to 50 centimeters in height and were crafted from solid pottery, sometimes reinforced with an iron rod interior. Wood and brass were other preferred materials for sculptors, and to a lesser extent, 
stone was also used. These artworks featured intricate decorations through incising, painting, or the addition of three-dimensional components. The subject matter of these sculptures was diverse, encompassing human figures. Bearded warriors on horseback were a common motif, as were kneeling or crouching figures with upturned faces. Many of these figures depicted ordinary people, sometimes even displaying symptoms of tropical diseases. While it's rare for artworks from this period to be traced back to specific, professionally excavated sites, their sheer number suggests that they may have served as both everyday decorative objects and had ritual or burial significance. The 15th century marked a period of decline for the Mali Empire. The absence of clear rules for royal succession led to frequent civil wars as brothers and uncles vied for the throne. Furthermore, as trade routes opened up in other regions, several rival kingdoms emerged to the west, with the Songhai Empire being a notable contender. European ships, particularly those of the Portuguese, began to sail regularly along the west coast of Africa. This development posed formidable competition to the Saharan caravans, which had previously been the most efficient means of transporting goods from West Africa to the Mediterranean. The Mali Empire faced external threats as well. In 1433, the Tuareg launched an attack on Mali, and the Mossi people, who held the lands south of the Niger River, followed suit. These incursions, alongside other internal challenges, marked a decline in the empire's influence. Around 1468, King Sunni Ali of the Songhai Empire conquered the remaining territories of the Mali Empire, which had dwindled to a small western region. This marked the absorption of what remained of the Mali Empire into the Moroccan Empire in the mid-17th century. The glorious era of Mali had waned, and its once mighty presence now resided in the annals of history.